Hey, so with this video, I wanted to talk through um, the development of a landscape. And I wanted to do this with a slightly different approach that's more textural and loose and messy. Um, a lot of times I would do more of a, a drawing type approach that's very technical in its origins and very precise in its origins but you know with this one I wanted I knew that I wanted to make some changes from this reference photograph and um, what I did first was just sort of analyze the value by eye dropping the reference photo and everything's dark and and sort of lifted out of the lights so maybe the brightest thing is is not quite white maybe 20 percent away from full bright white and I also wanted to lift the blacks because I knew I wanted to colorize this image, um, though this demo is only going to be in black and white. And what I wanted to do here was look at shape density and blank areas. So the top was going to be basically a blank area, and the shape density overall is pretty high. Um, there's a lot of small shapes in this particular reference. And I wanted to use that idea of just uh, a collection of small shapes below a collection of other small shapes with the contrast of inorganic and organic shapes. So when I'm doing all these kind of loose, uh, almost messy marks, the way that I'm doing these marks is by um, contrasting horizontal, vertical, and straight diagonals with arcs and curves and sort of just patchy organic marks and the way you would do this if you were doing this in analog media is mostly by using the side of a pencil or the side of your utensil or if you're using markers you, you would kind of build out from sort of a, a middle value marker or a light value marker and and slowly build up these layers um, at a certain point um, when you work beginning, beginning mostly in the middle, you kind of have to anchor things and pull out um, some darks, maybe like 70% dark, um, and put those in and kind of lay out where you might find dark patches. And do the same thing with the light. Take 30% light and start patching out some areas where you're gonna get light. And those don't have to necessarily be totally related to the way that the light is actually filling the space that you're drawing or painting. Um, that can mostly be a design thing. Um, the other thing that I wanted to focus on with this is atmospheric perspective. And most people have kind of a gross misunderstanding of what that is. Um, most people think it's kind of smoke or haze and uh, soft edges in the background, right? Because of that smoke or haze. and Really, that's not the case. What it actually is, is the idea is that contrast brings things forward. So, you know, if you use like absolute white and absolute dark, that's going to want to like right next to each other in the same object, that's going to want to be in the foreground. Um, if you use low contrast, right, like very dark versus slightly less dark, that's going to go in the background. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be middle values, right, that go in the background, although a lot of people do that because it, it sort of makes sense. Um, it can be very bright in the background as long as it's low contrast it'll go back so you can actually be very detailed in the background if you want um, but if you do it low contrast it's going to sit in the background um, so you notice I've already set that up with um, this early in the the um, image this video is sped up 500 percent so um, it's uh, it, it. I went very slow with it. The total drawing time was about two hours and forty minutes um, before being sped up. So um, I think it's worth it to slow down when you're doing this kind of process. And what the advantage of this kind of process too is that these random, these almost random marks, like the kind of marks that you make loosely, messily, suggest something that maybe wasn't in the reference photograph or 
suggest emotion or something that wasn't there and the mark itself can ter can turn into something sort of the way that you look at clouds uh, in the sky and find objects there um, and I find that to be very interesting um, and I think it it can be very much worth it to play that game with with this approach one of the things that I did there was reduce the contrast in the background um, for uh, Mount Vesuvius um, this is done based on a photo of Herculaneum which is outside Naples um, it's an interesting town Herculaneum because unlike Pompeii when Vesuvius erupted um, they all got out so they left the city intact but there's no like death or bodies or anything there. Um, it's not fully excavated either, which is kind of interesting. And this scene is particularly cool. Um, and why, what fascinates me about the area is that the top of Herculaneum, uh, is just slightly below street level of the city. And I mean, yeah, of course that makes sense because it all got filled up with lava <laughs> and then they built the town on top of it. So what's neat is that you get a full city under a city and um i just love that idea and and the vegetation in the background kind of marks the line so essentially what's weird about it is that this it plays with your sense of space because you see a fully you know a two three story four story city under a two or three story city um and that makes for an interesting subject for a drawing i think um and at some point you have to kind of get into some details and start exact, like finding out what these details are going to look like and how they're going to work. So being zoomed out, kind of working on the larger, um, aspects is good. Um, for the first, probably third of the, of the drawing time and anything that you do to the small spaces, you want to zoom out and double check. So, um, you know, the main thing about landscape drawing is, is that concept of atmospheric perspective. The main thing of architecture is, is linear perspective. And when you're drawing architecture like this, what's cool about it is that there is some sort of hint at two point perspective and some one point perspective. But largely it's these flat shapes and the contrast of the, of the angular shapes against the, the organic shapes is really what this is about. You know, it's, it's more of a two dimensional approach than it is, um, about creating forms in space. And that to me, is a different mode of thinking. Now, one of the things that I did here to just double check myself, I knew I didn't want to go with line in the end um, to kind of obviously delineate everything, but because I was having trouble making sense of all of the little soft marks that I made, I went back through on a separate layer and just threw in some lines to kind of help it along. If I were working with pencil, I would do this just very faintly and then it would sort of disappear into the rest of the rendering. But since I'm working digitally, it, it makes it easy enough just to go ahead and um, do this on a separate layer and then just hide or delete the layer. I think I wound up deleting the layer later. Um, but what's nice about this is that it gives you um, some clear anchor points sometimes to just define um, a particular area with line. Um, it, line is a tool, right? Just like anything else that you have in, in drawing and painting. Um, and you can use it for different purposes, right? So here I'm using it more as a thinking tool, right? I say, well, you know, where have my thoughts drifted off of my original intentions and how can I bring this back and make it make more sense? Um, cause sometimes that texture 
doesn't necessarily work um, for every little thing. Um, and what this is doing too is this is also helping me clean up the linear perspective, right? Because there are some angles there and I wanted to just be sure that they all s at least sort of agreed with each other. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect when you're working like this, right? Um, because it is about the shape design. The, the perspective can be slightly off and no one's really gonna care or even notice because you're combining it in with the landscape and landscape t is typically about atmospheric perspective and overlapping shapes. So, um, but you don't want there to be any glaringly obvious errors either. Um, so here I'm zooming out and sort of defining those shapes to make, to make sure that I got the shape density correct. Um, or was working towards that. Um, because what I wanted was sort of these medium sized shapes um, and the foreground. And then as it goes back, you start just seeing the tops of, of partially destructed buildings. So I wanted like a progression back to like teeny, teeny shapes and like thin lines going back in space and then bound with this organic um, vegetation everywhere. And I think um, towards the end of this, I probably want to add more vegetation in the small details. Um, because I remember being there and all this vegetation kind of like growing out of the ruins of everything where dirt and dust had collected. Um, you know, the, the growth is trying to break all of the bricks and concrete apart. And that's an interesting subject in itself too. So now what remained um, in this part of the in this part of the stage was to go in there with the value um, and sort of block in these areas according to what I'd drawn out in line and sort of get a little precise with that and start knocking down or building up value in ways that will help the kind of idea that I had about these like medium and small shapes progressing backwards and working on that contrast, you know, make sure like straight lines are relatively straight, even though I'm not using a ruler or any like line tool or anything like that, you know, just being sure that everything's just, you know, correct in terms of its linearity and the other thing that I wanted to do on this part is find some anchoring points where I can darken out areas that I know that are going to be in shadow and just be brave with sort of the bright, the brights as well. Um, and really work this foreground area, right? So the foreground area had the, has the most contrast um, because again, we're working with that atmospheric perspective concept. We want the, we want the foreground to, to come forward. So um, what it needs to do is have the greatest degree of contrast within the same objects and in close proximity to each other. So these foreground objects, they needed to have like, you know, the 90% black and the 20%, 30% white um, so that it opens up the value range. What using high contrast does, uh, like I just said, was it, it opens up the value range, right? It allows me to say, well, if I have, if I'm working with, of the total value range, if I'm working with about, you know, 70, 80% of the total value range, that means that as I go further and further back, um, I have less and less range to work with in the foreground say I were working with 30, 30 or 50 percent of the value range, that means by the time I get to the back, I don't have that many values to work with. I, I'll eventually run out of values um, because I will have used up all of the potential contrast ranges by the time I get to the background space, especially in something um, as with as many layers as this has, and as much complexity as this has. So what opening up that value range does is allows you room to work as you go backwards. 
Um, you can always come back and reduce the contrast later. Um, with digital, you can use various filters and um, image editing uh, sort of techniques. With um, analog media, with pencil and stuff like that, you can take a kneaded rubber eraser and just push it down on the page and lift up material. And it allows you to sort of lower out contrast ranges as you see fit or as needed. Um, and I think what I'm doing here is I'm changing the shape of this tree because I didn't like the original shape of the tree. It was like kind of too perfect. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to do is kind of start massing out like the smaller areas uh, of these trees so that they start to make more sense and then give them a contrast range that's appropriate to a tree. Like even though there's lots of light on the tree and, and they look bright yellow, like they're not super bright in terms of when you put them into a grayscale, right? Trees tend to be darker overall. So um, I think a good way to do a tree is a two to three step value range. So you have like your light, medium, and dark, especially in the foreground. Background trees, they can be like one solid value. Middle ground, they can be two values and it can work just fine. Um, and I think, I think what I did later on was do, do like kind of a three step value for all of them, but then narrow that value range each time. It's a very like logical way to, to look at it, of looking at my value scale and um, just kind of saying, well, as I go back, I'm going to very logically just restrict the value scale the further and further I go back. So when I'm back into the sky and mountains, it's like literally a 5% difference. So it's like if you're, if you're on a value scale of 10 values, like it's ha it's a half step like between two values on a analog value scale that you'd make with 10 steps. So it's a very subtle distinction, but it's there. And because the edge is hard and it's very precise, you can perceive it really easily. I could probably get away with a 2% difference, you know, um, and it would work and it would work just fine. The other way to do it is with color, you know, um, but we're working in black and white, so we'll stick to that for now. Um, now in these, um, in these shape, in the shape density thing, it's time to get into the really small forms. Um, where there's just these thin lines kind of just going back in space and small buildings and small little squares that the textures sort of suggest. So rather than using a large brush, it's time to get into like a smaller brush, use the point of the pencil a little more um, and get into some of the finer details. I thought one of the, one of the things that would start to help sell the image too was just having some some very clear cast shadows right so making sure that the trees cast shadows onto the buildings making sure that there are clear cast shadows from the overhang of the roof onto the building and just being very specific about how like what the light direction is and how that's operating you know one of the other things to do is to make light bounce around and reflect off of other objects um, but i don't think this has like tons of reflected light. Mostly what you have is, is direct light and then the atmospheric light. The atmosphere kind of makes everything look blue in the reference photo. Um, and, you know, in, the, in colorizing this, that's kind of where I went with it. Um, you know, here again, it's working into these small forms, right? Just like some of these forms and shapes are just teeny. And um, getting into that um, and being very specific about some of them, I think was really important to me because I didn't want to, didn't want to leave it just, didn't want to leave it too textural, right? It can, sometimes working texturally, it can be um, too nonspecific, just like when you work, you know, in that, in 
on the opposite end of the spectrum, if you work very precisely, it can be like dead and cold and precise, and it can lose all of the energy. So what you try to do here is work your way towards precision through this sort of gestural loose approach and kind of begin to guide and control some of the chaotic marks into more productive um, sort of forms. And I think one of the best ways of doing this is to, to sort of take a pass through the whole image and kind of skip around to various places. And you don't want to render anything too much without touching every single area of the paper or canvas. So here I'm just making sure that I got to everywhere, right? And um, you know, this isn't going to be like a fully rendered, fully finished drawing, but it's going to be um, like pretty far along for three hours. Um, I think the interesting thing about working with this textural approach is that it does take a while. Um, but what's fun about it is that it, it allows you to make some decisions that you wouldn't normally make if you're drawing precisely from the beginning. Um, because it, like the abstraction of the marks is leading you to shapes that are different than you would normally pick um, consciously. It's almost like your instinct is taking over, and uh, that's what I love about it. Um, you know, if you were to do a landscape and architecture combination, I think the focus really is is more on the atmospheric perspective and the overlapping shapes, right? The approach that you take to do that is is entirely up to you. Now, the other thing to think about is like what percentage of the image is going to be architecture and what percentage is going to be land, uh, landscape, right? It could literally just be one house and a landscape, and that would be fine. Um, it could be fencing or old crumbled fencing uh, in a landscape just to show like a little bit of the human element. And that's kind of what we're after. So this is actually like, you know, maybe the top 20 to 30 percent is obviously landscape then there's, you know, a 10% of it. So maybe it's like 50% landscape, uh, even though it feels very architectural, right? So it's a, it's a sort of a strict balance between the two, which is kind of fun. Um, in other situations, we might want to manipulate that and make it more landscapey, right? And make it more, um, more obviously in in the organic realm but what i thought was interesting about this was that 50 50 thing where you're like you know hey it's like the middle of a big city but half the half the stuff is organic vegetation and so on so here's what i was talking about um with like using uh low contrast but detail right so in that building you can see the side of the building you see four four windows being developed and each building can have its own uh, main value, right? So that can be like a white stucco building next to a gray building next to a red brick building. And if each one has a similar contrast range, even though each building might be darker or lighter than the other, um, that doesn't really matter because you're working in low contrast. And when you work in low contrast, you can get as detailed as you want. Um, and so moving through this, this is like a modern echo of what's going on below. So you can see all of the old building techniques with the new building techniques and see how the shapes might be similar or different and see how the heights might be similar or different. You know, one of the strange things about um, this ancient architecture stuff is that the systems that made it work back then still work today, right? They came up with post and lintel doorways and we still use those. Um, they have arches to make things strong. We still use those. Um, yeah, we use like more, like a greater variety of building materials, but you know, they were still using brick and mortar and 
concrete and everything. Um, and we're still using that the same way. Like, you know, we have plumbing that isn't, I mean, isn't all that much more st sophisticated than what they had in the beginning um, when they were developing all of this stuff. Um, you know, we have electricity and pumps to make a lot of it work and they were using gravity, but still made it work, you know. Um, I think it's worth thinking too about how things are constructed when you're doing sort of inventive approaches or things where you're modifying reference heavily. Um, so if you think about how these construction methods work and if you know a little bit of architecture and art history, that can only help um, the stuff be more convincing. Um, what I think is interesting too about this is with the organic side, making sure that you have some of the same species of trees in the foreground, middle ground, and background if you can. Um, it's kind of nice because that allows you to see the the, the scale difference go back uh, in space because it, you keep that recognizable shape as you go back in space. So, um, you know, having these palm trees in front and in back uh, can help you with um, laying out the space and and covering the amount of depth that you wanted that you want to cover. Um, and I think overall, I probably spent the most time on this, uh, on the organic stuff on this tree here, because I could never get satisfied with the overall shape, just didn't like it very much. Um, and so uh, off camera, I worked on it uh, a ton after the this after the point where this video ends, and just kept pushing it around and changing it and changing it and changing it, you know. Um, I wanted to have a cast shadow from these trees too, to make sure that, that they were integrated into the space and casting their shadow on these buildings. Um, this building's definitely too high contrast that I'm working on and that needed to change significantly. Um, and I don't think I got to it uh, yet uh, as far as like this particular drawing goes, but noticing it is good because you that allows you to make that change later and come back to it you know that's just too big of a value jump from the side to the front you know it doesn't need to be that big right um if the edge is sharp you can get away with very subtle value distinctions you know um so after this it would be about getting into these small details and picking areas where you really want the focus to be and rendering out those areas of focus which um which I think is really important, and um, that's kind of like the next stage of where where you would go with this. But you know, so much happens in this sort of like layout and first two or three passes that I felt like this was a pretty good place to leave it. Um, I I hope you got out of this some critical ideas, um, and and the main takeaway is about atmospheric perspective, detail, and and um, you know, progression of shapes and overlaps.